Good evening and welcome to A Conversation with Jamel Hill. My name is Lauren Moore and I'm a sophomore at Round Rock High School here in Round Rock, Texas. I play both volleyball and basketball, but tonight I'm your MC for this event. How is everyone enjoying the Black Student Athlete Summit so far? <laughs> The Heeman Sweat Center for Black Males under the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement here at UT Austin hosts the Black Student Athlete Summit each year as a way to bring together various stakeholders supporting black student athletes. This year's theme is the mental health of black student athletes. As the only black girl out of 17 girls on my volleyball team and only one of three in the entire program from freshman to varsity, I can probably relate a little bit to some of the college athletes here today. However, my parents, Leonard and Thais Moore, have always made me, my sister, and my brother watch movies about slavery and black history so that, <laughs> so that I'm always comfortable with who I am. I think they had me watching Roots when I was like three years old. <laughs> and over the holidays, we went to watch Harriet and Get Out. As we begin tonight's program, we will have a, a special welcome from Mr. Mark Lawrence, who is the new director of the LBJ Presidential Library. Although newly appointed at the LBJ Library, Dr. Lawrence is a familiar face on the UT campus where he has taught history since the year 2000. He is a well-known scholar on President Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War. As a professor, he earned numerous awards and as the director of the LBJ Library, one of his goals is to help younger generations appreciate the importance of the 1960s and how President Johnson's legacy continues to impact us all. The LBJ Foundation is the host sponsor for tonight's event. Mr. Lawrence will be followed by Mr. Chris Del Conti, Vice President and Director of Athletics here at UT. Texas Athletics also serves as a sponsor for the summit. Please help me welcome Mark Lawrence to the stage. Well, good evening and thank you, Lauren, for that fantastic introduction, it's truly a privilege to be up here tonight and to have assumed my duties as the director of the LBJ Library. Thank you to all of you for having me. I think Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson would be enormously proud that tonight's event is taking place here at the LBJ Presidential Library. This institution is well known as a preeminent venue for discussion of public affairs and has a long history of hosting very distinguished visitors across the political spectrum who challenge us to think hard about big issues of our time. And unquestionably, sports and the place sports holds in our society ranks high on the list of issues commanding our attention. LBJ had particularly warm words for those Americans whom he regarded as what he called doers and builders. The people, I think he meant to say, who would take up the challenging tasks on what he called the front line of national life. And the student athletes in our audience will no doubt play such a role in our society that is not only consumed by sports, but searching for role models to emulate and goals to pursue. Welcome to all of the athletes among us tonight. After tonight's program, we invite all of you to come upstairs inside the uh, grand, uh, the, the great hall of the, the library to enjoy some refreshments and to explore the library's exhibits. You're certainly warmly invited to visit the permanent galleries that delve into LBJ's presidency and the larger history of the 1960s, but I also hope that you'll take some time to visit our special exhibit, which is entitled Motown, The Spirit of Young America. This exhibit, which is curated by the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles, celebrates the 60th anniversary of the Motown record label. It not only highlights the color and sparkle of one of the major cultural innovations of the 1960s, but also calls our attention to the political importance of Motown, which has sometimes been called the soundtrack of the civil rights movement. This is the first major museum ex exhibition to embrace music, culture, and politics of Motown. It traces the evolution of the label, focusing on its major artists and musical achievements, and it explores how the sound of Motown continues to influence some of pop music's most important artists to this day. But before we get to any of that, 
and you have the chance to enjoy the reception upstairs. We have a tremendous event to look forward to right here on our stage this evening. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Chris Del Conte, the Vice President and Director of Athletics at the University of Texas at Austin. Since coming to UT in 2017, Chris has made major changes in all areas of the athletic program. A former track and field student athlete himself, he's now spearheading, among other things, the renovation of the south end zone of the football stadium. He's breaking ground on a new multi-purpose basketball arena, as some of you may have read. He is bringing cutting edge innovations to our athletic facilities, and he started a series of Longhorn City Limits musical performances on the LBJ lawn that lies between us and the football stadium. So he's a very busy man, uh, uh, doing so much impressive work to make our community the vibrant place that, of course, it is. And I'm told if you don't follow Chris on Twitter, you might consider doing so. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chris Del Conte. Thank you. Hey, Chief. You're the man. This will be quick. I know why we're here. <laughs> right? I know why we're here. I just want to welcome everybody to tonight, right? It's an important night. Right, and I, and I look back at sport. I have no notes, by the way. The, like, Mr. Dr. Moore, these are your notes. I just messed them up. I have no notes. We're going to go off the cuff for a moment. Sport and society has always been influenced and mirrored what goes on in our country. This, this symposium, there's 200 athletes here. There's 200 staff members from around the country. What you learned these last two days, they've been running you ragged. It can't end today. You must take what you learn and go home. When I talked to Dr. Moore, my esteemed colleague, and I'm so impressed by him, he looked at the enterprise of intercollegiate athletics and said they need help. They need help. And this symposium is to help each other grow. Each of us to take something out of here today and go home and say, guess what? Someone that experienced the same thing I'm experiencing on my campus, I have an idea of how I can help. I have no answers to a lot of your questions. But what I do is I listen. And I've learned from the colleagues that are here today, I've learned from the colleagues I work with on a daily basis about the trials and struggles that happened to our student athletes, right? And I asked Dr. Moore, why this particular symposium? Who is the voice that's gonna listen to an African American on campus, what they're experiencing? Who is gonna sit there and say, this is the mental struggles that they're going through? They're, maybe, they're completely different than what I went through. You take what you learned today and you go home and you say how you can help your campus. Do we all understand that? This cannot be for naught. What is happening today and why we're gonna have this esteemed speaker, I can't wait to listen to her speak, is because I look back at my own life in college athletics and wonder what's how sport mirrored society. From 1936 Olympic Games, to Wilma Rudolph, to Billie Jean King, to Muhammad Ali, to Colin Kaepernick. These have been people that went through and said, here's what's happening in society, and sport was that platform to talk about it, right? Things that are happening and you're learning today here must be taken home to learn, right? I like to sit down with our, our student athletes and learn from them. I love how having lunch with our women's basketball team. Uh, Joyner's my favorite lady. She's nuts. <laughs> I love her with all my heart. She's crazy. She makes me laugh at all times. If I'm down, I'll go find her just to sit. She has beautiful eyes. Just looks at me like, that guy's crazy. <laughs> I don't walk in her shoes, but I do watch her. And I watch all of our women's basketball team to, for, to them to see uh, Mrs. Hill and I was awesome. But those are things that I get to watch from the outside in. This conference is going to fix what were our ailments in our society, but also what goes on in our athletic program. So please, Take what you learned today and go home. Bestow your knowledge to your coaches, to your staff, to people that you're with, because we're all gonna get better if we're all in it together. You understand the concept? We good? Hook them. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Can I get a hook em? That's garbage. One more time. Can I get a hook em? Yeah, baby, I love that. Y'all be good. Yes. 
I'm pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, who is also my dad. Leonard Moore is currently the Vice President of Diversity and Community Engagement here at the University of Texas at Austin and the George Littlefield Professor of American History. He has been at UT for 13 years. Before coming to UT, he taught at LSU in Baton Rouge where I was born. He earned his PhD at The Ohio State University and his undergraduate degree from Jackson State University. Like him, I hope to attend an HBCU as well. My goal is to play volleyball at Howard University. He loves his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, and he always tells us that we should move back. But, <laughs> well, we can all agree it's a little sketchy there. <laughs> My dad is really cool, but he can be a bit extra at times. <laughs> Everyone says we have similar personalities, so maybe that's why we argue a lot. He and my mom, Thais, have been married for 18 years. My sister, Jocelyn, is 17, and my brother, Leonard, is 14. Please welcome my dad, Leonard Moore. Good evening. If, if any of you all have a middle child, that's a middle child right there, all right? <laughs> But um, I want to welcome everybody here, and I want to thank uh, Mark Lawrence, uh, Dr. Mark Lawrence, my colleague in the history department. Can we give him a hand on his appointment as head of the LBJ Foundation <laughs> Library? And also Dr. Mark Up the Grove, uh, the most important man in Austin, Texas, who runs the LBJ Foundation. All right. Uh, and lastly, the best athletic director in the world and the only person I know who has a personality like mine, who is loud like me, Mr. Chris Del Conte. All right. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Tonight is a sort of a surreal mo mo moment for a lot of us. Uh, the woman I'm about to introduce, many of us have admired from afar. And I don't know about you all, but just even walking through an airport or something like that, uh, you know, we would see her on the screen and we would stop, you know, and say, okay, what is, what is this sister talking about? Uh, Mrs. Jamel Hill, and understand it is now Mrs. Can we give her some props for that? All right. All right. Uh, a proud Detroit native, uh, the product of Mumford High School, that is Detroit Public Schools, all right? Uh, uh, graduate of Michigan State University, and I know she's a bit, ooh, you got some Spartans in here? Oh Lord, okay. Um, a distinguished career in journalism. Uh, she told me today that she spent some time in the great city of Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, I know Houston has Frenchie's Fried Chicken. Chicago has Harold's Chicken, but Cleveland, Ohio has Hot Sauce Williams, all right? And we were in South Africa when, I think in 2016, when the Cavs finally got a ring, and, and I think she tweeted something out that my boy tweeted. She said, Hot Sauce Williams gonna be off the hook tonight. And I knew at that point, if Hot Sauce Williams was a reference, this is the woman I really want to know. She currently works for The Atlantic, and she has a pop podcast. Uh, that it, that called Unbothered, that I encourage all of you to check out. So what can we please, uh, and, and here, when I describe Austin, Texas to black folk who are not from here, I say it is the white version of Atlanta. <laughs> all, right? all right? And black folk know what I mean, right? Okay? So if white millennials were making a TV show, they would call it Austin, all right? <laughs> so Austin, can we give Miss Jamel Hill a warm welcome? All right? That was a spirited introduction. <laughs> hey, I, I'm a product of the sanctified black church. Yeah, I know that's right. Introduce folks right. Yo, right? and shout out to whoever shouted out Michigan State. Thank you. Yeah, look at that. And any Detroiters in the house? What up, though? What up, though? <laughs> you can't take them Detroit folk nowhere. Nowhere. All right? <laughs> But Joe, thank you for coming to Austin. You've been here about a day. What, what are your thoughts so far? Well, this is like the third time I've been in Austin, and that Atlanta reference was hilarious because that is absolutely true. <laughs> um, but no, I love Austin. I think it's one of the best food cities in the country yeah. for sure. Uh -huh. um, I have enjoyed my share of fried chicken here. 
Okay. Sorry to live up to the stereotype, but it is what it is. Um, but no, I mean, this is a great city, um, very progressive city, so I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Fun place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, like my daughter said, she's like, no, nah, daddy, we straight on Cleveland. All right. You know? <laughs> she didn't know. You ain't teach her about, you know. Right, right, the, right. right. She that was on the grit Cleveland. Right, that, you were. That, what, that bone thugs? Tell me you bone raised, thugs? Them, raised them. I, I'm them. a suburban kid. I, was, I wasn't a bone thug. <laughs> I rep the suburbs all day, all right? Jeez. Um, Not that East 199? The 199, right. <laughs> okay. So I'm always interested, we know where you are now, mm -hmm. I'm always interested in it childhood influences in many ways that, that sort of shaped you, that put you on this, this amazing career path. So when you think about growing up in Detroit, first, what did the city of Detroit put in you? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, well, look, Detroit is a very resilient city. Uh, it has a lot in common with Cleveland, actually, uh, in the sense of a city that people often like to disregard, disrespect, yeah. ignore. The only time when I was growing up that I saw Detroit make the news was when they announced the most dangerous cities in, in the country <laughs> uh -huh. and, and those cities with the top murder rate. And usually Detroit was in the top three all the time. So we either made it for that or we had this tradition called Devil's Night where uh, the night of Halloween, people would just light uh, all the abandoned buildings and some buildings that were occupied on fire. <laughs> That's how we got down. So Detroit was always in the news for something negative. And I think because there was this large percentage of the country that felt like Detroit um, should be forgotten, that it wasn't worthy of certain things, that you automatically are raised there with a chip on your shoulder. And I grew up as... Um, that great urban philosopher Jay-Z said, the real hood, not the rap hood. Huh. And so, um, you know, growing up, I think that way in an environment raised by a single mother, um, you know, living on welfare for most of my childhood or a good percentage of it, it just gave me that hustle. I mean, anybody, talk to anybody from Detroit, we have a hustler's mentality. We grind. And so, to me, once I decided that I wanted to be a journalist, which I, I decided in high school, um, and I was lucky because I was somebody who realized what I wanted to do very early. Uh, I just have been on the grind ever since. So it was, I was very process oriented in the sense of, uh, you know, sort of bringing my lunch pail to the computer or the typewriter back in those days every day. And so that was always my mentality. It's like, yeah, it's gonna always be journalists who are better than me in terms of like they might get bigger scoops or they might wind up in better places, but nobody's gonna outwork me. Does that explain the Detroit versus everybody t-shirts? Yeah, I mean, it was for everybody from Detroit. It's like, we really do feel that way. I mean, I, I will never forget when uh, when it was the recession and the auto companies, some of them, not all of them, were bailed out. And the attitudes that people had about them bailing out these auto companies, I mean, a lot of it was because they were, not just because they were rich and billionaire companies, but, you know, this is the, the lifeblood, the DNA of Detroit. And it's kind of funny now because uh, seeing Detroit now is, is hella gentrified, mm -hmm. <laughs> as a lot of places are. and. Uh, now Detroit is kind of a cool city, and I never grew up knowing Detroit in that way. So um, I always love my city because I feel like it really gave me good perspective. And you know, when people um, ask me, particularly about the president, um, when they ask me about you know the tweets and the controversy and all that stuff, and I'm like, you know, the president calling me out—that's nothing because where I grew up. Like, the president wouldn't even rank in the top 30 worst things that ever happened, if you want to, like, they wouldn't even be in the top 50, to be honest with you. So I think having that perspective, that has allowed me to deal with things like that and other setbacks or other things that have, have bubbled up in my professional life. When did you know you wanted to be a journalist? And did you know you wanted to go into sports or that developed? Oh, right away. Life? Right away, I knew I wanted to go into sports. Um, I was a neighborhood tomboy. Um, and you know, when you grow up in the hood, you sort of make your own fun. Mm -hmm. And so like we used to do like backflips off garages <laughs> on the dirty mattresses, like just dumb stuff. <laughs> Hopping fences, who could hop the fence the fastest, like just <laughs> stupid stuff. So I was always engaged in those shenanigans and you know, um, playing you know, baseball and freeze tag and all, right. all that stuff. Right. So um, I, had, I was, you know, back in my day, I was an athlete myself, you know? And so because of that, it just, I developed this love for sports. I don't ever remember not liking sports. Like, it was just so natural. Uh, I love the competition. I love the stories behind it. Just love the game, whatever game it was. Um, 
And so I also loved to, to write, and I was a voracious reader. And, uh, you know, I, I had a library card, and I still, in every city I've lived in, I have, I've had a library card because I think it's important, A, to support the public library, and B, I just, you know, kind of love to read. And um, so adding those skills up together, it equated to being a journalist. So when I was in high school, I joined my high school newspaper staff wrote for the high school newspaper, wrote sports. I was a sports editor. Granted, I was a staff of one, just me. And the cool thing about uh, being a part of the high school newspaper is the way it worked in Detroit is all the Detroit high schools, they published their paper at the actual professional paper, the Detroit Free Press. So they put an insert once a month in the paper of all the high school newspapers oh, wow. in the city, mm. which meant that I got exposed to a professional newsroom when I was like 15, 16 years wow. old. So going into that newsroom, the first time I walked into it, it was just a lot of energy, a lot of people yelling at each other, a lot of activity, and I was like, I want in on this. I don't know what this is, but I want in on right, it. Right, right. And so I started answering phones in the sports department of the Free Press when I was in high school. Now, did Detroit have two papers then or one? Two, yes. yes. Uh, the Free they still have two, it's okay. just that they have this, they call it a joint operating agreement, so on the weekends they're combined. So. Mm -hmm. This was the Detroit Free Press, and they had a uh, they had an apprenticeship program, a uh, high school apprenticeship program, where they took ten to twelve Detroit area high school students, and for six weeks you got paid and you learned about how a newspaper operates and specifically what journalists do. And so I got picked for the program, and it changed my life. And uh, getting picked for that program in conjunction with the same summer that I was at the Free Press as an apprentice, the National Association of Black Journalists Convention was in Detroit. Mm. And they marched us down there and made us, <laughs> uh, they made us register as students. Wow. And so I joined NABJ when I was 16 years old. Wow. And those are the two most life-changing events wow. that happened that set me on my way to becoming a professional journalist. When did you realize that you were pretty good as a journalist? I still don't. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess you can say You know that, what I mean? There's a phone call, a job offer. Well, there are something. things yeah. you feel really good about. Mm -hmm. There are stories that I write that I feel good about. I'm like, man, I really nailed that one. Or interviews you do. But I've never sat back and said, you know what? I'm kind of the, you know what? Like, I've never <laughs> done that. Because that just I, that's right. just not really who I am. Now, I felt as if I could really make a mark in this business as I started to elevate. You know, I go from a high school newspaper to working at my college newspaper. I, I had five internships in college, wow. uh, one of which was in Cleveland, That's which right. is how I wound up uh, living four months there in uh, good old Cleveland Heights. And mm -hmm. so as I was making these moves, I really, with every move, it started to solidify that, yeah, I can really make a living at this, and this is this is what I was born to do, because I can't, they always tell you, it's like the old guidance counselor question, when people try to figure out what they want to do with their lives, what would you do for free? And I would write for free, right? And so that's how I knew that this was something that my soul needed to do, because I can't, I can't do math, I'm terrible at it. So it's like I'm literally limited in my options here. And so journalism was something I always felt like I was just born to do. Passion. When you look back at, say, the first five, 10 years of your career, what one article or story did you write that when you look at it now, you like? Yeah, if I had to, if they had to talk about me for writing one piece, <laughs> this would be the piece right here that I would want to represent. Probably when I was 22, I used to work at the News and Observer in Raleigh. And I wrote a story about the Citadel's first female athlete. Mm. And the Citadel, uh, I, you know, for those who don't know, the Citadel used to did not admit women into um, the university. And there was a big thing when they admitted the first woman, Shannon Faulkner, I think that was her name. There was a big mess and a whole lot of things happened. But then, you know, when all of that calmed down, they, they got their first female athlete, a cross country runner named Mandy Garcia, who was from Fayetteville, where J. Cole was from, in case you're, you don't know that. <laughs> Fun fact. Pass along at parties. Um, <laughs> uh, and they called it Vietnam, actually. Um, and because there's a lot, of, it's a huge military influence in this town. Anyway, I wrote a story about her and spent some time with her at the Citadel as she is going through what they call knob training, which is, it's not hazing, but they put the freshmen through a grind. And she's the only woman there. And it was G.I. Jane before G.I. Jane. And uh, it was just really inspirational to watch, and that was the first time I really realized the power that sports has in terms of 
it's not many things where you can discuss the intersection of like race, gender, all politics, all these things, and they can come together in this messy container in sports, and it can help you look at things in a different way. And so I saw the power of that through this article, which I, that was the first time I ever won a major award. So I won the North Carolina Press Association Award for Best Sports Feature. And it's a story I just will never forget. People always think the best things you write are about really famous people, and famous people are cool and they're fun, and famous athletes are great. Some of them, um, and that's that's fun in itself. But the stories that I have found throughout my career that really have had the most impact on on me and on readers ha have been people you have never heard of. And I don't know what Mandy Garcia is doing now, but she had a lot to do with why I write the things that I write now. So wherever you are, Mandy Garcia, thank you. <laughs> uh, the NABJ always talks about the lack of African American sports writers. It's mm -hmm. declining. Uh, what was it like as one of the only, not only one of the only few African-Americans, probably the only uh, African-American women in yeah. a lot of these locker rooms, newsrooms, things of that nature? What were some of the sort of the challenges you had to sort of navigate? Yeah. Well, the good thing, and I talk a lot to aspiring female sports writers about this now, especially black women uh, who want to get into this profession, is that the first thing you need to have before you walk into any door, before you step into any locker room, is a sense of belonging. Mm. Meaning you need to believe that you have a right to be there. And I was very lucky because I had female mentors early in my career uh, when I was working at the Free Press as a high school student. They had some female sports writers on staff mm -hmm. who took me under their wing and they gave me the confidence and the sense that I could do this I never for a moment thought this is something women shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And because I had that mentality going in, uh, that's not to say that I wasn't anxious, that wasn't to say I wasn't ever nervous, but I did not have, I wasn't intimidated when I went into a lot of these environments. I knew that there was going to be a certain amount of stuff that I would have to take mm -hmm. going into it. Now, oddly enough, I mean, the majority of kind of uncomfortable moments I had were mostly with readers who, you know, I can't tell, if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me to go write for Cosmopolitan, or for that matter, to go uh, go back to Africa, I would be right. rich as hell. I wouldn't even be sitting here, okay? Because right. I yeah. heard them both, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes in the same sentence. Right. So, um, so hearing that early on, uh, your skin does toughen, and I hate to tell women that because it gives unfortunate license to the people who want to tell you that, but there was a lot of, Whenever I wrote something that a reader didn't agree with, the automatic go-to would be like, that's why women shouldn't talk about uh, sports. That's yeah. why black women don't belong. That's why blah, 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 whatever. Um, but the, in most situations, coaches, athletes always treated me very you know, respectfully. Of course, there is that level of you know, awkwardness or discomfort you feel when you walk into a locker room and you are literally both the only woman in there and the only person of color in there. And so you're just like, all right, just me in here, huh? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, so right, you right. just have to kind of get used to environments where you're the only one all the time. And it could feel very isolating mm -hmm. for people, but I was lucky because I had a very good, you know, support system. I mean, the other layer of it too, that you face, and this is not just germane to being a sports journalist or this industry, is, you know, <laughs> black people in whatever work environment we go into, we all get the, how did you get here? That's basically <laughs> what they're asking. Like, oh, they're like, oh, so what made, how did, yeah. I can't figure this out. It's like, I went to school just like you did, you know? <laughs> I had internships, it ain't that complicated. But there is this, um, there is just this mentality that you have to face of constantly having to prove to people, and I hate to use the word prove because I don't give a whatever, but, um, but you constantly feel like people resume checking you all the time. It's funny, I was told the group the other day, I was at a faculty council meeting. Uh, you know, I think I'm a faculty member, they told me I was. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my colleagues referred to me as an assistant basketball coach. <laughs> See? <laughs> And so I said, well, maybe you'll see me coaching tonight. I don't know. All right? <laughs> but, but I think, but you're right. But isn't yeah. that uh, yeah. sort of the dilemma of the black professional? It is. It's not just, yeah. that's what I said. It's not just in, in media, but yeah. that is just kind of, um, we know we're going to face that coming in, into the front door. And I would never forget, um, 
uh, somebody who, it wasn't a colleague, but uh, just a peer just casually said to me as we were waiting outside, this is when I covered Michigan State, and we were just waiting outside uh, for the coach to kind of come out, and we were just talking about the business and just casually said, oh, well, you'll have an easier time because you're black and you're a woman and they want to hire you. Mm. I'm a white dude and they won't have, the, and I'll, you know, he's like, I'm a white dude, and so they're not looking for me. Let me just tell you, <laughs> I, why I found that to be particularly interesting is because one, I was the only one. I'm looking at 10 white dudes around me. So I was like, clearly they're not looking for me. <laughs> they're looking for you, all right? Uh -huh. And later on when I was in Orlando and I was a sports columnist, my first sports, a sports columnist job, I was the only black female sports columnist at a daily newspaper in North America. Wow. Notice I didn't say America, hmm. North America. Yeah. I was one out of 305. So yeah, I got all the breaks. Right. <laughs> they looking for me, like, okay. <laughs> Think the white guys are safe, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's all right. Is there a, a uh, is there a sort of a code of conduct, I would say, between that manager relationship, I mean, between, say, a black sports writer and a black athlete? And let me, and let me you know where I'm going I with this. I do know where you're going with this. Because we have a brother on ESPN's competi com 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 major competitor, who appears as if his whole, uh, what word, I'm looking for one of those big words. I'm looking for, I'm looking for. <laughs> okay. So, uh, it's, it, it appears his whole uh, shtick, is that a word? Okay, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Is bashing black athletes. <laughs> yeah. Talking about people being bad fathers. Uh huh. Talking about Jason Whitlock, y'all can figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I have never known you, Michael Smith, Bill Roden, mm. others, to go there. Well, I mean, my, my personal principle, cannot speak for anybody else, yeah. um, is I would never say something about an athlete on TV I can't say to their face. Mm. And um, I think that's a good guiding principle to have. Now, some of it, coming up in newspapers, uh, I was always taught that if you write a column, write an article critical of an athlete, show up at the locker room the next day. Okay. Give them an opportunity mm -hmm. to respond. Mm -hmm. You know, they may agree, they may disagree, right. but they feel better being heard. And I do think that most uh, black sports writers, we have that dual consciousness. We understand that, yes, we're media members, we're uh, objective, we have a story that we need to write, we gotta tell what the facts are. You may not like it, mm -hmm. but hey, you may not want us to put you, missed them free throws in the critical situations, right. but the fact is you did. So that's all good right. and well, but I do think that there are certain areas yeah. that you shouldn't go because I can't speak to them. I can't say what kind of father anybody is. I'm not at home with them, I don't know. I don't know what kind of husband they are, whatever. Like that's none of my business. So. Um, I do think that there is, it's okay for us to be aware of certain perceptions, particularly that um, follow black men and certainly the, the perceptions that even follow black women. Like the number of conversations and debates and times I've written about Serena Williams and how yeah. she's perceived. Um, I think it's okay to bring that consciousness to the table. I think it's what makes us unique as journalists is that we understand culturally what certain black athletes mean. We understand culturally when certain things happen, why the community reacts to it the way that we do. Um, you know, I mentioned Serena, like a real easy example is when she crip walked on the court and right. people lost their mind. Right. Uh -huh. I thought it was great, but you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but still explaining why these things happen, yeah. that's what you're supposed to do as a journalist. You're supposed to put things in a, into context. So, um, you know, look, there are people who don't necessarily feel that responsibility. You know, I, I can't speak for them, but I just know right. for me, it's always been important that I not distance myself from my blackness being a journalist. And that doesn't mean that they gonna always agree with what I have to say, right. but it does mean that I don't, I, I'm not, I don't consider Journalism, journalists here and blackness here is like, mm. nah, I'm black before I'm a journalist. Wow. You know, it's not like the cops pull me over and be like, see this journalism badge. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> hang on yeah. Here. yeah. Um, <laughs> I love talking about race, sports, and politics. Same. I think it is, 
I mean, I, when Stephen A. Smith had his show, I had a chance to be on there talking about the Michael Vick case, had an OJ episode and like, black athletes and vi- and I loved it. And you know, I would get hate mail. Think about hate emails when they tell you to go back to Africa. And I told this one guy, you brought me here, you send me back. Right? <laughs> and first class, by the way. Right, right. <laughs> I'm like, how right. you brought me over here? <laughs> but they will send it from their work email. Yeah, I know. So I just pick up the phone and call. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know what, that's a good one. Call I, got, I gotta yeah, do that, yeah. I gotta do that. That's, right. that's a good one, okay. all right. But here's the thing about uh, race and sports and politics. There's always been the intersection. Always. So people talk about, let's keep our sports free of politics. I'm like, it has always had an aspect of that. So this brings me, you know, to um, your situation with our president, mm-hmm. you know? Um, do you ever regret sending a tweet calling Trump a white supremacist? I mean, it's true. <laughs> like, I don't, okay. Okay. It's hard to regret when you tell the uh-huh. truth. I mean, like, <laughs> no. But the funny thing is that I, I thought of this as I was watching, not the last debate, maybe the debate before that, but one of the Democratic um, presidential debates is that people just openly call the president a racist. And it's like, ah, you know, he's a racist. Everybody's like, okay, well, we've just accepted this, right? Uh-huh. So it was just funny that it's now openly said by other politicians. And, you know, when I said everybody acted like I just said I grew another head. Um, but I, I get it, though. It was more or less the who and the where, as in who was saying it mm-hmm. and where I was, as in representing ESPN. I didn't okay. say it on an ESPN network. I said it on Twitter. But I think that was the shock value. And I wasn't even the first to say it. I say this all the time. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates laid out a compelling case to why the president was a white supremacist for the Atlantic um, in an article that, you know, is definitely one of the best that I've ever read. And so I wasn't, it wasn't even original as far as I was concerned. And so it... Um, Did the surprise, were you blindsided by the response? A hundred percent. I was totally blindsided. I did not, one, I said it in a reply. If I really was trying to create controversy, cause a stir, I'd have added the president and said it. But I, did, I was literally getting in a back and forth with somebody on Twitter who was trying to, this was at post Charlottesville, where everybody heard the both sides um, comment that he made. And um, I was in a, in a debate, it wasn't a um, contentious one, but it was a debate with somebody who was still trying to hold on to this idea that this person um, was misunderstood, could, you know, could be better, give him a chance. I'm like, nah. So that is the context of which that happened. And so I was as stunned as anybody to, uh, after, to see this, that snowball effect. I mean, it just, it went everywhere. It was just like, it, it, I said it, it was out there for some, for hours before anybody even recognized what was said. And it was, you know, it just was a, a media person uh, at a competing network who picked it up and made everybody aware that I said it. And next thing you know, um, you know, I gave Fox News some free content and it was, it was kind of everywhere. And certainly I never, even within the reaction, I never expected the White House to ever care about what a sports anchor would say about the president. But I have some friends who cover the White House and i never forget, we were actually preparing for the show that night, and um, one of my friends who was in the briefing room texted me as soon as somebody asked uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders about whether, they not, whether or not they thought what I said, whether or not she thought what I said was a, a fireable offense, and she said yes. And I was like, wow, the White House just called for me to be fired. <laughs> yeah. You don't have anything better to do, okay. Um, so that's when I was just like, it, when that happened, when it, it, it got that far, I knew it was just a matter of time before Trump tweeted about it. Knew it was just a matter of time. And so it just sent my life into a tailspin and not because um, you know I regretted it or anything like that, but it's just the, the wave, the constant wave of attention and how it just kind of upended my quiet little existence yeah. was really quite extraordinary and it happened in such a period of time that it was it was quite an adjustment for me. 
And I was watching a video, I think you were at a women's leadership conference or something, and you were reading some of the, the hate, hate mail. mail yeah. and, the, and the misogyny is one thing. This was misogynistic times 10. Yeah, I, um, I've written a lot of pieces of my career that have incurred strong reaction, yeah. and I've gotten a little bit of that, but the level of reaction that my comments generated, and I was, it was uh, uh, LeBron's media company, un Uninterrupted. They did a, a great program called The Day Ones that was um, where they led a collection of, of storytellers. Uh, I hosted it, but I was also a part of it where we just talked about some of the adversity that we faced. And actually, I had never read the hate mail until I knew I had to do this event. So I like literally just read it a couple months ago. And I didn't even, get all of it, it just so happened that this batch of hate mail accidentally went to an executive at ESPN who gave it to me mm -hmm. and I just kind of, I didn't really want to read it so I just kind of put it somewhere and I knew at some point I would read it. And so finally I decided to kind of open them and I was like, ooh, ooh, oh, oh my. <laughs> I was like, I was just, yeah. it, was, it was some frightening stuff. I got a lot of death threats, a lot of people, calling me all manner of names and combinations that were quite creative, I must say. Um, and it was, it, was, it was quite startling. So um, I'm glad that I read it when I did, you know, when it's far removed from the incident and where I wouldn't be that emotional about it. So I just, I kind of laughed about it. And now I, I kind of wish I could call him and just to let him know my husband has a gun permit, so. <laughs> so don't try it. <laughs> what is the message in that for, uh, I would say, uh, young professionals who want to be activists? Well, but, uh, who, but who balance this idea, I have a platform, you know, I'm a part of an institution where I can do good. Right. You know what I mean? That, that sort of inner turmoil we all have. So I have, a, I have a kind of two separate answers to that. As much as people I know put me in this category, I, I'm not an activist, mm -hmm. okay? Um, my journalism is my activism, okay. which is different, right? And so uh, if you are a journalist, it's, you're, you're walking down a different path because you know, you're sort of pledging to put things in context um, to certainly uncover truths and that sort of thing. And again, as I said, through your journalism is your activism. So that's, that's one part of it. And, you will find stories along the way that you feel like are worth, um, that people aren't paying attention to, that need uncovering. I bring this up about Ida B. Wells all the time. The reason we know the pervasiveness of lynching is because of Ida B. Mm, Wells. That's right, that's and so right. that to me is a model of what a black journalist can be and should aspire to be. Mm. On the other end of it, if you're an athlete, if you're somebody else who has any kind of platform, I think the most important thing you have to do is realize what is it that you are willing to sacrifice? What is it that you are willing to live with? Mm. And for me is that if I would have lost my job the second I sent that tweet, I'd have been fine. I'd have been okay with that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's not to say that I would not have mourned the career that I had yeah. there, but I could have lived with myself. Mm -hmm. I could not live with myself for apologizing, and I was never gonna do that. Yeah. Um, I apologized to my co-host, uh, Michael Smith, who supported me 100% all the way because of the crossfire I put him in. I apologized mm. to the president of the company at the time, John Skipper, because of the crossfire that I put him in. But I was never gonna take back what I said. Well, how do you respond to the critique, like, Jamel, you lost the platform? No, I didn't. You were the only sister holding it down <laughs> like that. You well, know? The, the thing is, independent of this, of this that happened, and it took this to make me realize this is where I was. I mean, I guess to unravel it and go all the way back, I was unhappy being on Sports Center before that happened. Wow. I was leaving anyway. Wow. It's just a matter of when. Mm. And the reason I was, Sports Center is a great platform. I mean, we've seen yeah. some legendary anchors that yeah. have. You know, they help create this into the brand that it is. It's the company's baby. It's, you know, it, it's, I couldn't even really put into proper context what Sports Center has meant to American culture, not just yeah. sports culture, right, not right, just pop right. culture, right? Yeah. It wasn't a fit for me. And since day one, I walked into ESPN, I have given my opinion, mm -hmm. commentary, that's what I do. That's not what that platform is for. Yeah. And so we were a few months into it, and I was like, yeah, Mike, I, I think this is going to be it for me. 
Yeah, I mean, I, at the end of my contract, I was just like, I definitely want to transition to do something else because uh, we were, based off our contract work, we had to do the 6 p.m. for three years. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. also I tell people who say that I got fired from it, that wasn't possible. So <laughs> read the contract language, y'all. So at any rate, um, way they set up, don't work that way. Um, so I knew that before then, and the one of the many reasons why I'm thankful that this happened is that it put, uh, it, it sped up that process of me really figuring out what I wanted to do and understanding that as great as ESPN was, and as much as that was the best job I ever had, the longest job I ever had, it had begun to feel claustrophobic to me. So while I know how it looks to people, they're looking at it like you're in people's homes every night, right. but I was limited in what I could do. And I wanted to see what my life, my professional life would look like if I were without limitation. And so that's the, the phase that I'm in now. And I don't blame ESP for that. They're a sports network. Their job is to bring you highlights, show you games, um, uh, give you uh, an idea of what these athletes are like, how they're able to perform. The kind of writing and the kind of commentary I wanted to do is much more in line with what I'm doing now. I wanted to talk about that messy intersection mm -hmm. between race, gender, sports, and culture. That's not what ESPN is built to do. And so I wanted to be in other spaces where I could do that in a much more freer way. Can we shift gears, talk about Colin Kaepernick for a minute? Uh, uh, of course, speaking of messy convergences. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> I'm torn, and let me, let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the Kunta Kente shirt was a little over the top for me. All right, but. I have a retort for that, but go ahead. Okay. Uh-huh. I'm waiting to hear it, but okay. Okay. Um, I mean, me and my students, we argue about this all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's as if we're sort of making these Ali comparisons. But when, LA, when Ali went to Houston, and refused to be inducted, he took it. He didn't go back and beg the government, you gotta let me fight, you gotta let me fight. Mm -hmm. And part of me wonders, Kaepernick took a stand, got paid, don't know how much, mm -hmm. all right? But then Eric, he acts as if he is entitled to a position with the NFL. Mm. You disagree, so I'm waiting to hear no, that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna circle the trigger word okay. entitled, how so? I don't believe Kaepernick has a right to play in the NFL. Okay. I don't believe his trade is restricted. Okay, got you. Uh, Canada, arena ball, go play flag football. And, <laughs> that's funny, huh? <laughs> and, but, but what I'm hearing from my students is that no doubt he has a right to play, and the NFL has to employ him. Well, uh, right is subjective. Um, mm -hmm. That is true. However, uh, it's a difference between, you have to understand when something like that has been taken from you. Okay. See, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get injured and all of a sudden he's out the league. He didn't do, he didn't violate the personal conduct code. and. And that's, he wasn't Antonio Brown, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Out here making terrible rap songs and all manner of foolishness. Like he didn't, right? He didn't right. talk his way out. Like he didn't do any of that. They literally took him out of the league and he lost his job uh, and lost his career out of pure cowardice, pure cowardice by the NFL owners. And that was it. And I would say this, um, and I would disagree with you about that is that, you have, to, you, you have to see this in the con context of labor versus management. Okay. There's a lot of different trades in America where you have a labor force that's represented by a union. Okay. And they have squabbles with their management all the time that are resolved and they still maintain their employment. Tom Brady sued the NFL. Where is he? Wow. In the NFL. Huh. He sued him, yeah. lost, right? Decided, all right, I got to take these four games. <laughs> but he still went back to playing. Why should Colin Kaepernick have to give up what he's worked his whole life for because a bunch of NFL owners are too cowardly to stand up to Donald Trump. Because this is literally what this is about. Huh. It's not about anything else. I encourage, if you haven't already, to go back and look at the New York Times report where they talked about that secret meeting 
that the NFL owners had with some of the players. And they told them, they laid out exactly what they wanted, how they wanted it to go. They said they needed a liaison to take the social justice platform away from Colin Kaepernick and just shift it in general so the NFL is about social justice. Hello, Jay-Z. They told you they were doing this. Huh. They said it. Huh. They spelled it out. We need a liaison. We need a face to present it to basically black people right. who had decided, many of which had decided they didn't want to patronize the NFL anymore. Y'all saw how, what happened at the Super Bowl. Colin Kaepernick wasn't even there, and he hijacked the Super Bowl because okay. every talent that came up there that was performing had to answer the question at some point, Travis Scott, why are you performing in this? Hmm. They didn't want that anymore. Yeah. They were tired of this guy who is not in the league controlling their narrative. And that's what the NFL does. They suppress narratives for their own, own benefit. And Colin Kaepernick was a problem. Eric Reed sued the league. Where is he? He's playing. It's true. Okay? Yeah. So it's suing the league was what he did because it was a labor dispute. Mm. You guys have colluded to keep me out of this league. You've had a president that told Jerry Jones, which he testified, this is a winning issue for me. Don't let him in the league. If you do, I'm banging this drum all the time. Wow. That's why he's not wow. in the league. It's just that simple. And I don't think that's okay. Yeah. And I think that is um, one of the most um, spineless things I've ever seen. And you see now Donald Trump will have a $10 million ad mm. during the Super Bowl. Wow. Connect the dots, people. It's not that hard is that they don't want him in the league. So getting back to the Kunta Kinte shirt, realize that he could have shown up in this. He could have shown up in a white tee. He could have shown up shirtless. He's not getting back in the NFL. That's why that workout, people who question whether or not he wants to play, uh -huh. <laughs> do you know somebody who has decided to stand on principle in the way that he has? <laughs> Tell them to come and work out for a bunch of scouts you know you're not getting in the league, and he still does it anyway. Yeah. And the only reason why there was any beef between the NFL and Colin Kaepernick was because they were trying to get everything on their terms. They were not being transparent. And considering these two have sued each other in court, are you shocked there's trust issues? Of I course there are. Mm -hmm. But he still did it anyway. Yeah. I'm a 49ers fan. I watch all of Colin Kaepernick's professional games. He is in better shape now. He looks in better shape now than he did when he was playing. Does that sound like somebody who doesn't want to be back in the NFL? Well, how, how do you respond to the, to the, to the GM or, or owner who says, I respect Kaepernick, but I don't want my backup quarterback being a Are we a sure he's a backup, number one? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen some of the guys that they've trotted out here? <laughs> I mean, look, <laughs> you know, I'll take the Lions. You think they would have rather had Colin Kaepernick or David Blow? Oh, no. You think yeah. this past week in Philly they would have rather had Josh McCown or Colin Kaepernick? Yeah. Right. It's not that hard. So this idea, so then if they say, well, I don't want my backup quarterback, so NFL teams, coaches, GMs, owners, they always tell you what? Number one most important thing is winning. So if you're like, oh, well, I don't want my backup, I don't want a distraction. So that means you're not making a football decision. You're making a, I think this will go this way decision. It's not about football, right? So if it's about football, if it's about this guy can play and I need him, then, then what? Colin Kaepernick, I say it all the time. I'll add something else to it. If he had hit a woman hmm. or tortured a dog, he'd be back in the NFL. Wow. Wow. He'd be back in the NFL because those wow. are corrective behaviors hmm. to people. Wow. Like you can sell to the public that <laughs> if somebody hits a woman, oh, they don't do that anymore. Hmm. They, go, they went to counseling. They're okay. You know, Michael Vick, he served his time. Yeah. And this is obviously no disrespect to him. He deserved to play. But you can prove that's a corrective behavior that's not going to happen anymore. You can't sell to the public. You know what? Colin Kaepernick no longer believes that it's an injustice that unarmed black people get shot. <laughs> you can't sell that. <laughs> you cannot. That's not going to go over. You know what? He, he no longer believes that this country has systematically and racially oppressed black and brown people. He's off that now. It's like, no. <laughs> so they couldn't control the way that he thought. And they were concerned about the influence he would have on other players. And they were pissed that he put the NFL in an uncomfortable position of being um, politically bantered about and 
looked at as a, a political vehicle to gain political points. They were upset about this, and this is, and then again, the Donald Trump factor, so that's why he's not getting back in. Uh, so I don't think he's being entitled. I think he saw something taken away from him. This is somebody who is one under throw away from going to back-to-back -to -back Super Bowls. Mm. Wow. You know that you can be the very best at something and somebody just takes it away from you because you, I don't know, had the crazy opinion that black people shouldn't be getting shot unarmed. You'd be upset and entitled to. <laughs> let, me, let me throw this out, and I, I, I want to get to the uh, Atlantic piece because as an HBCU alum, <laughs> it hit me. Okay. All right? uh, but do you think that black athletes have this unfair burden to be community leaders. You know, I tell people, when I, was, when I was working at LSU for nine years, I went to New Orleans all the time, and I never heard the Manning brothers yeah. get asked, what are you gonna do about inner city New Orleans? Mm -hmm. And I'm asking because on an international scale, when I saw that LeBron and Harden were getting challenged with these questions about China, but no, but no other athlete yeah. has ever been put in a situation where they are required to talk about foreign policy matters. Did you find <laughs> that to be interesting? No, I, it was true. It was, it was funny because I, I don't know, I'm old enough to remember when they were telling LeBron to shut up and dribble. And then all of a sudden, uh, it was like, speak about China. Right. It was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, okay. Um, that was a quick redirect. No, it, it's no question that um, black people especially athletes, are unfortunately put in this awkward position of having to be spokespersons, of having to be community-minded. And look, I wrestled with this when I wrote that piece about the piece I wrote for The Atlantic was about, you know, what would happen if, if uh, sort of top caliber uh, high school athletes decided not to go to um, predominantly white institutions, PWIs, and instead would go to HBCUs where they could theoretically kind of rebuild them with the, um, uh, with the money they're able, to, money and attention that they're able to generate uh, because HBCUs have been the bedrock of our community for a long time. I mean, even now in the workplace, 40% of black professionals come from HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So there's a base there yeah. that can be built and harnessed and expanded and who in a better position with their talents and their abilities to continue that tradition and and for once, us sort of be in control of our own talent mm -hmm. than, than black athletes. So that was what the piece was about. But to your point, I did struggle with this idea. Like, you're putting a lot on somebody who's 17, 18 yeah, years old. Right, right, right. And then this idea that they have to not just worry about their own families, um, their own smaller communities, but worry about this larger mm -hmm. question of our race. As uh, awful as that burden may be to, to the degree of like other athletes don't get it, at the same time, um, it's necessary. Hmm. And I'm not saying every athlete has to do it, because I'm hmm. often asked, like, you think every athlete should stay, black athlete should stand up and, you know, take a stand or do whatever? And no, because quite honestly, some of us ain't equipped for the conversation, Cam Newton. Um, some of us kind of need to sit this one out, Kanye West. So it's just like, all of us ain't able to be in these, you know, kind of discussions or to have this platform. So I always say, do what you can where you are. Do what you can where you are. Every, everybody doesn't have to take a knee to, to make a huge impact because along with that knee, you know, Colin Kaepernick is um, very invested in programs um, to help felons uh, better re-enter society, you know, by helping them with job interviews, giving them suits, like all sorts of things he's involved in that are making, as much as the gesture of taking a knee has had a worldwide impact, the work he's doing on the ground is really what matters, but. Um, Let me tell you why the article hit me. Mm -hmm. I am a proud Jackson State alum. Yeah. I mean, they took a brother when nobody else would, with a 1.6 GPA, and a 15 on the ACT, and a 720 on the SAT. Hmm. And that's why my kids like, Daddy, you can't get on me about my grades, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, and, and I'm just being fully transparent, mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes if I have 
I know I haven't sold out, but that's what I want to say. No. Okay. Yeah. But no, but no, but no, but no, but, but understand, and I think. I know what you're wrestling with. Most black with, yeah. professionals, we're at elite institutions. The Atlantic is elite. Yeah. We never heard of it until Ta-Nehisi Coates went there. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is true. And so I wonder, should we be the ones to say, we're going to start the renaissance? Yeah. So I'm going to leave Texas. I'm going to leave Princeton. I'm going to leave Georgetown. I'm going to leave UCLA. And we all going to go set up shop at Prairie View. So that's a real fair question. And yeah. I... I'm coming from the glass house of having gone to Michigan State, right? right? Okay. And I have always written and worked at mainstream media publications. Mm -hmm. And I'm with you in the sense that instead of putting it on a generation behind us, yeah. rather, that we should be at the forefront of that. But there's got to be a structure and foundation in place to be able to do it. And I would not be opposed. I mean, part of the reason I wrote that piece is because, you know, I knew what my college choice was. I knew, you know, a lot of my friends went to PWIs, but I was writing that mostly for, um, to try to spark a thought and for not just younger athletes, but for people in our position. Yeah. And I try, to, I try to live it and do it in my, in my everyday life, even in, in, in the mainstream spaces that I'm in, right. is making sure that you know, I'm employing a lot of black people. Mm -hmm. You know, the podcast that I have is like I have a, a black producer. I have two, three black producers. Um, I have a black talent director. Is like that's yeah. part of my mission is to put us in a position where we can chart our own destiny. So it's not just about going back to HBCUs. Okay. I think that's a part of it. But I think in our daily lives, there are things that we can be doing to support and empower black people. Period. And so that's kind of where I am yeah, with it. Yeah. So w while your talents, obviously your talents are very well respected around here, but are you using those abilities, and I know you are, but just yeah. throwing it out there, are you using those abilities to somehow uplift or get other generations of black people through this door here in Texas? Thank you. And I think that's all, that's a big part of, of what we all kind of are burdened with and should be burdened with, right. is feeling that sense of responsibility. So it's, it's kind of larger than that. Right, but it was, it was a good Yeah, but, that's a, but yeah. That, look, that's something and I, know it's what, when I, I get, certainly wrestle when with. When I read something and get offended, it's because I'm, because you're hitting a nerve. Right, hit dogs yeah. holler, right? right? Is that what they say? <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, no, I, I, look, again, and I, I got a lot of people that responded to the piece, uh, a lot of black people who were just like, yeah, but where did you go to school? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. what are you? I mean, we you will know? pull that card we, out. Look, and I, I was like, I went to school. I was like, me telling you FAMU was my second choice is doing nothing now, but that's okay. <laughs> right. They were, but that's okay. Right. Right. See, it was my mama's fault. Right. That's a whole right. other story. Yeah. No, right. but um, yeah, but I, I, I think that's a big part of it. And just as I've gotten older, too, is one thing that I really am trying to do is I'm trying to to stop being so hard on black people. Because we could be real hard on each yeah. other, right? Yeah. Very hard. Because, uh, look, white supremacy don't need no help. Mm. Definitely not from us, okay? Yeah. And I think there is, a lot of us need to check our thinking in terms of like when we patronize black businesses, mm. even when it comes to black institutions. Like I've heard, I've been in the room and heard <laughs> black people talk about black schools. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. it's just, I'm like, man, I, I might have expected this from somebody that didn't look like you. Right. Yeah. And you know, for you to sit there and say, well, they just not as good and you know, education won't be this and that. This is coming from other black people. Yeah. And so I have definitely um, try to do my best to kind of move away from that. And we need the support and empowerment like more than ever now. So that's, that would be sort of my message. My wife is a UCLA product. Uh, she comes from educated black folk in California. <laughs> uh, but she always says that if she would have went to an HBCU, she probably would have went to med school. Mm. You know, so it's funny sometimes the, 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 the folks who went to PWIs like, wow, I wish I could have went to an HBCU. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of, that whole debate plays itself out at a lot of black events. Oh, because, well, you know, yeah. we know what campus life is like yeah. at a PWI. Right. Um, <laughs> I was like, I can't speak to what happens here, but right, right. Uh, I can just say my own experience is like, I mean, the first time I ever got hate mail was, was at Michigan State. Yeah. That's the first place I ever got called a nigger was at Michigan State, wow. right? Mm. So it was like, uh, and with the hard ER. 
So I'm just like, well, hard, hard, um, yeah, right, right, so right. that was not, you know, right. so having those experiences there, I mean, yes, granted, it gave me a glimpse of what the real world would be like, but at the same time, um, that's something that, especially now with the climate being what it is, I, at least what I found in my research is that there's a lot of black students who are looking now at HBCUs yeah, as safe yeah. spaces yeah. because Never. that element is, is so strongly out there. Absolutely. Uh, last question, then we'll have some question and answer. I'm not sure what Ryan and Darren are. I think they're moderating that. Uh, got a lot of young professionals in the audience, uh, brilliant people. A lot of them work in college athletics, got a lot of student athletes there. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I appreciate about you, Mrs. Hill, is that you have longevity in the game. And I was telling the students the other day that I've been a professor 22 years. Can you give them some advice? You know, don't do a lot of the job hopping. You know what I mean? Try just around building a body of work. Yeah. And so you don't be a flash in the pan, you know, so, you know, you can have longevity and your effectiveness increases, mm -hmm. you know, as you get older. So um, there's, just, there's just two bits of advice that I had. Uh, one would be control what you can control. Mm -hmm. And by that, you cannot control people talking about your work, what they say about you. You can't control what your boss thinks about you. You cannot control a lot of these other elements that are frankly quite subjective. What you can control is showing up on time, how hard you work, um, you know, uh, the degree in which you challenge yourself. You could control all those things. So worry about those things. You know, don't worry about who don't like you, who does like you, like that stuff is just like really irrelevant. Um, but focus on what you, as uh, I think it was Chad Ojosico, he, he said one time, uh, focus on your focus. Huh. And uh, that will get you way further than you might ever Im imagine. And having that core and that foundation and thinking that way, that's how, that is how you actually attain a lot of longevity is when you focus on you. Don't worry about such and such got a promotion I didn't get, they got a job I wanted. A lot of times those things that other people get that you think you wanted are exactly what I said, you think you wanted it. And then you see them in it and you're like, maybe I didn't. <laughs> or then something else comes along that's better than that, that puts you more in line with what you want and everything kind of works out. You know, I, I am one of those people that shamefully believes everything happens for a reason. I've never regretted turning down anything. I've never even thought about it. You know, so um, I think you, sometimes we get very caught up in a lot of the stuff that we can't even do anything about and worry about the things you can do something about. Much better use of your time and energy. And the second thing I would say to you is ABL, always be leveraging. Mm. Um, because mm. <laughs> seriously, leverage gets you so much further than a lot of other things. You always want to put yourself in a position of leverage um, and hopefully put yourself in more situations where they need you more than the other way around. I always thought the best time to ever look for a job is when you already got a job that you're happy in. Huh. Because you know what will happen? If you look for a job then, you will hold them to the highest of standards in trying to get you. Mm. When you're desperate and looking for a job, you're like, all right, 50 extra cents an hour, <laughs> bet, I'm there, <laughs> right? But if you're yeah. already happy, yeah. You know, you're making that strong 15 hour. You're like, they got to pay me 30 before I have to leave this job. You know, like you will do better by yourself if you, um, you know, look when you, you don't need to look. You know, I, I always try to put my position, myself in a position where they're going to want me before I, I need them. Absolutely. So can, can we do some rapid fire for like 60 seconds? Sure. All right. Uh huh. Boys to men or new edition? See. <laughs> Man, this ain't even hard. Come on, give up some of our new edition. All right. New edition. All right, all right, all right. Now, I'll get up right now and do If It Is In Love. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, you know what I think on this. Okay. Jordan, LeBron. Jordan. Yeah, that's how you got it. Yeah. Now, now, realize that this is, the, this, is, this, this is the part, though, is that when it's all... I, there is going to be, prepare to fight this fight, okay. all, right? all right? Be be this old person yelling out a cloud with me, all okay. right? And it's happening right now, but really like five years from now, people are going to be saying LeBron is better than Jordan, like they're saying the sky is blue. 
Okay. And so everybody will look at you like you are insane. We're <laughs> like, no, it was Michael Jordan. I seen it. Okay, what is okay. he? I seen it. So All right. I'll say this. He, Jordan is better. I think the best moment, the most phenomenal thing in sports history the last 50 years, me and my family in South Africa, mm -hmm. the Cavs down 3-1. Oh, that's true. We getting up at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> Wait, is it, is it we or just you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> See, we all, we all uh, Cavs fans. Okay. Three in the morning, I got I to gotta be on campus at eight teaching the class. <laughs> you down 3-1, and you, and you get three straight and two in Golden State. And one of the greatest teams in history. That's right, that's right. Now, if he wins well with the Lakers, will this change your mind? Oh, no, he, I mean, he's on the mountaintop already. Okay. <laughs> My Cleveland folk in the house out there. All right. All right. All right. Um, you still bitter about that Craig Elo, aren't you? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, no. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> I can tell you where I was when Craig Elo got traded. I was a freshman <laughs> at Jackson State, <laughs> fall 1989. <laughs> and that's when we traded Daddy, got Daddy Ferry for Ron Harper. So that, that may be even more sick. But here we go. I didn't mean to trigger you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I heard you mention something that you said, Isaiah Thomas, not the, the real Isaiah Thomas, all right? Please not this tell one, them this. Right? Number 11. <laughs> Did you say he was the best point guard ever or the best player under six feet? I think I said he was the best player under six feet. You would take him over Allen Iverson? Yes, I would. I don't care how much I owe. <laughs> Again, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> With a T, I see it. <laughs> Ooh, I don't care. <laughs> Y'all better go look at YouTube. See them look. <laughs> okay. Can we give Miss Jamil <laughs> Hill a hand, please? All right. <laughs> Uh, are we doing questions or no? That's a question. Uh, uh -huh. right. uh, thank you. <laughs> Jamil, we appreciate you being here for your thoughts and, sh and sharing out. The audience has a few questions okay. for you that we want to uh, pass over to you. So the first one is from a track and field uh, student athlete who is a journalism major okay. uh, at Stony Brook University. And she there you go, shout out to your school. <laughs> and she'd like to know, how do you deal with rejection within your career? Wow. Mm, that's a great question. So, as I mentioned a few moments ago, I always look at rejection as purposeful. As mm -hmm. in, there's a reason why this did not happen for me. Um, I don't necessarily look at it as, uh, oh, you weren't good enough. Though in some cases, that actually might be the case. It might be uh, a situation where there's a skill set you didn't have. It could be actually something along those lines. But putting that aside, though, uh, I think the best way to deal with it is just look at it as an opportunity to get better. Um, if there were things that you felt like you weren't as sharp as coming into whatever situation or if you were up for an interview and like, you know what, I could have done that better, then take that as an opportunity. Don't try it hard as you can not to look at it personally. Um, and I know it feels very personal, especially when you're serious and personal about your craft. But any time that I got rejected, usually it was for, it was for a good reason, as in um, it wasn't a job I was actually meant to have. I just believe that what's for you is for you. Mm. And nobody's gonna be able to change that. And so when you get rejection again, just see it as an opportunity that's gonna put you on a more you know, direct path. I'll tell a, like a quick story. So before I wound up at ESPN, um, right, uh, right before they even came into the picture, Yahoo Sports had actually called me about a columnist job to be an NBA columnist. And I was all excited about it, like, wow, Yahoo, that'd be great. You know, and some of my friends were over there, that'd be awesome, da 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 And, um, you know, we went quite far in the, in the process. And then I got ghosted. Like, they literally mm -hmm. didn't wow. call me again. Wow. And I was wow. real <laughs> pissed about it. I was, I was very pissed about it. And maybe like two weeks later, I was having dinner uh, with the, one of the executives at ESPN and he asked me in for an interview. And because he just so happened to know a friend of a friend and they introduced me 
And, you know, I was kind of on my way. And um, I understood why they ghosted me because they hired a guy you may have heard of named Adrian uh, Wojnarowski. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I got it. Huh. Adrian is an amazing reporter. And, but I could have taken that rejection personally, but in hindsight, it was the best thing to happen mm, yeah. because I wound up at ESPN and being an NBA columnist, while that would have been a good job, yeah. that's not what I necessarily wanted to be doing. Yeah. So it all worked out. And so that's what I'm saying is that the rejection, as personal as it may feel, it may be putting you on a, another path or lining you up for something else that's even better. That's awesome, awesome. Jamil, you are the definition of conquering adversity, <laughs> but I know it comes at an emotional, mental, and sometimes even financial burden. What advice can you provide to student athletes that are facing adversity and are worried about how it's affecting their health? Ooh, um, and it, this is that probably the benefit of, of being a little older is that, you know, you kind of run out of you know what's the older you get. <laughs> <laughs> and you care less about certain things. But I would say this. Your mental health is not worth being compromised That's right. for That's the happiness of others. That's, That's real. That's and right. what, I don't know what age I was that I came to this um, conclusion, but I decided I was not going to be an emotional dumpster for everybody else. Mm. Mm. And when you, and it takes time and it takes practice, honestly. And it's hard because you don't want to be a harsh person and you still want to be a giving person, but don't give so much of yourself that there's nothing left for you. And so my advice would be like through whatever adversity and challenges that you're facing, that in whatever ways you can self care and minimize your mental stress, you need to do it. Cause it's something that we need to all take very seriously. I have this, you know, kind of individual theory I've come up with that like <laughs> all black people suffer from PTSD on some mm. level. <laughs> um, for real, like, um, me and my husband often joke, but it's, it's with a level of seriousness because of the way we both grew up that we're still suffering from hood PTSD. Because <laughs> he'll just do stuff like in terms of like, we live in a, a very good neighborhood in LA and he would just, he act like we live in like in the middle of a so I'm like, <laughs> they got coming in here? Like what are you <laughs> Okay, I get it, I get it, I understand. But anyway, I say all that to say is that um, the level of trauma that some of us have experienced, we haven't necessarily dealt with or understand how it impacts us because a lot of the things I realized that I saw and experienced growing up, I normalized it to the point I didn't even realize how messed up it was until later on in life. Right. And so I say all that to say is that you have to be your own first and last defense when it comes to protecting your emotions, protecting your energy, um, that's, a, that's a big one. And especially something I learned, um, you know, as I'm, I'm a newlywed, is that I not only have to protect my energy, I have to protect my partner's energy. Oh, wow. And so I just can't encourage you enough to be very intentional and mindful of the people that you're around. And if you feel like they're just not that they're constantly compromising or forcing you to compromise your energy, you need to really value check whether or not that person or people or situation or circumstances is worth you even including in your life. That's good, that's good. You referenced Jay-Z in the NFL earlier. Can you talk about your perspective of their partnership? Um, so I was, of course, one of the people critical of that partnership. Um, I question the NFL's intentions. I know what they're trying to do. As I mentioned before, they've made it quite known behind closed doors that they were looking for essentially someone in Jay-Z's position, um, somebody who the community and the culture rocked with to help them deliver a more palatable message to people of color so they could get them to buy back into what the NFL is about. Uh, so I was distrustful from that standpoint. I just don't understand what Jay-Z gets out of this. Mm -hmm. They need him more than he needs them. Hell, he even rapped about it, <laughs> wow. now, you know? Um, and while um, right now I just can't see what the play is. And I know there are some people are, who've been like chestnut checkers and this and that. Let me tell you something how the NFL works. Do any of you know of any 50% ownership stakes that are up for sale? Huh. They're none. Wow. So unless you're a 50% owner, it doesn't matter. You, I mean, Mark Anthony has 2% of the Dolphins, so it's like they don't consult him for anything. <laughs> they don't, like, they're not calling him, like, who should be the next coach. Those decisions are made by Stephen Ross. So everybody's like, oh, maybe it's ownership. 
how often does NFL ownership even come up? It's a reason why there's never been a black owner. There's a reason. So unless that was the goal, which I doubt, because again, if it's a 50% ownership stake that's up for sale, eh, we nobody knows about it. And that isn't really how that works. So what level of influence could he possibly have in a league that has basically 32 individual nations operating the way that they want, mm. that being the owners. <laughs> Roger Goodell works for the owners, not the other way around. So that's great if him and Roger are friends. That ain't got nothing to do with Jerry Jones's business. That has wow. nothing to do with Bob Kraft's business. That wow. has nothing to do with anybody else. So other than curating the Super Bowl, <laughs> what is his purpose? <laughs> wow. That's what he's doing. Ooh. He's curating the Super Bowl. <laughs> so the NFL needed those bad headlines to go away, particularly about the Super Bowl. So enter Rock Nation, who will make all the other artists feel comfortable about participating in the Super Bowl. And that's why Jay-Z is there. And to me, I feel like he gave up way too much of his cultural leverage and credibility oh. to help a league that don't need no help. Wow. Wow. Sticking with the NFL, uh, considering the Joe Judge hiring um, by the New York Giants, uh, oh. do you feel an equally qualified African American would be granted the same opportunity? And how do you feel about the Rooney Rule and how NFL organizations tend to dance around it? Um, nah, <laughs> y'all know a black coach would never get hired with Joe Judge's resume ever. Right. Somebody who. Um, I think he's all, all, eight, all eight years he's been in the NFL, he's spent with the Patriots. Uh, he did special teams, which is no knock, because John Harbaugh with the Ravens was a special teams coach. Uh, he's an excellent coach. And if you ask a lot of football players, they'll tell you that based off what they do in their skill set, special teams coach are kind of especially designed to be head coaches in many respects. Anyway, all that being said, he went from there to a wide receivers coach, and now he's the coach of the Giants. Um, on a wide receiver core that really was not good. Um, <laughs> but I digress. The problem is that uh, at the end of the day, um, there has to be a level of desire mm. to want to have black coaches and to give them an opportunity, um, or I won't say give, but to put them in line with some of these coaching jobs, and there is no desire. I really compare it to how the NFL used to be when it came to black quarterbacks. Um, it used to be this prevailing said and unsaid notion that black quarterbacks weren't smart enough to play the position, couldn't run an offense. I feel that there is a large contingent of NFL owners who feel the same way about black coaches, that they don't think that they are capable enough to lead. That's why the goalposts keep moving in terms of the qualifications. Yeah, yeah. They've been told forever, oh, you gotta be offensive coordinator. Because yeah. you know the NFL is all about offense and who can work with quarterbacks mm -hmm. and all that. Eric B. Enemy. Nothing. Kansas City. Nothing. Most uh, been one of the most prolific offenses the last mm -hmm. two years. You know, he has interviewed for seven jobs in two years. Wow. Even Marvin Lewis, when he was a coordinator, uh, he got passed over after they won the Super Bowl, after that, like, it took him 23 years mm. to be a head coach. Sean McVay was a head coach at 32. Last year, everybody was trying to find Sean McVay. Yeah. And their idea was white, young, offensive mind. That was it. So that's why Zach Taylor got hired in Cincinnati. Wow. You can say what you will about Marvin Lewis. Um, sorry if you're a Bengals fan, because, you know, been rough for y'all. But, uh, <laughs> but Marvin Lewis went to the playoffs six times. And granted, he never won a playoff game, but he never lost uh, less than four games. Zach Taylor, 2-14. and 14. Matt Patricia, 9-22 in his two years. Jim Caldwell took the Lions to the playoffs, 9-7 back-to-back years. They fired him, and when they fired him, they said 9-7 wasn't good enough. But apparently... Three and 13 is, because huh. they still got Matt Patri by Patricia, and that is, the NFL is just a microcosm of really what black professionals face mm. everywhere, yeah, is that exactly. the goalposts yeah. always moving. Soon as you get the qualification and experience, <laughs> suddenly the dynamic, suddenly it changes. <laughs> they want something else. They'll tell you like, oh, we want somebody who knows how to eat 20 bags of Skittles. Then suddenly you eat the 20 bags of Skittles, <laughs> and it's like, nah, 45 Snickers. It's like, what? But I just ate these 20 <laughs> bags of Skittles. <laughs> That's the way it works in the NFL. It's like, supposedly it was coordinator experience. Now it's, oh, we just like people who work with quarterbacks. 
You ain't heard Byron Leftwich's name one time wow. for a job. Wow. Quarterbacks coach. It's two black quarterbacks coach, uh, quarterback coaches or two black coordinators, offensive coordinators in the NFL. It's Byron Leftwich and Eric Bieniemy. Mm. They wow. have no job. Wow. So no, nobody black would ever get what Joe Judge got. <laughs> There's no precedent for it. All right, this will be our final question from the audience. <laughs> what social issues would you like to use your platform and your role in the media to address going forward in your career? Well, we just kind of hit on one, um, and I have a piece coming out with The Atlantic about this uh, NFL, the Rooney Rule and, and everything, because I do think it's such a microcosm of, of what black prof professionals face um, in the workplace period. Uh, you know, I think the other thing now, I think it needs to be a shift in how we talk about the conversation. Whenever uh, I talk about, it, particularly sexual assault, because I've written a lot about it and spoken a lot about it, um, especially in regards to some personal experiences, we spend a whole lot of energy in this country telling women how not to be raped. Mm. There we, we spend a lot. That's really where all the dialogue is. We spend no conversation telling boys, men, Stop raping people, mm. right? Well, okay, uh, none. Yeah. So, to that being said, is that we spend a lot of times asking black people how to solve racism. Mm. Why are we asking the people most oppressed by it how to solve a problem they didn't create? So now, what I would like to use my platform for, frankly, is to hold the people who actually um, continue to profit off racism, who continue to traffic off white supremacy, I want to shift it and put them on blast and stop asking black people to solve for, solve these problems. Can we put our hands together one more time for Mr. Jamel Hill? Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. We got a award for you over here. Oh. As you know, earlier at the luncheon, we gave out two awards. We gave out our uh, BSA uh, Legacy Award. We also gave out our BSA Leadership Award. And I said we had one more award to give out. And tonight we're gonna be, uh, Dr. Moore will be honoring uh, Mrs. Jamel Hill with our BSA Sean Adams Courageous Activism Award. So I'm gonna pass the- Thank you. Uh, Quick, uh, those of you who are from Austin, Sean Adams was an amazing journalist. He was one of the few African Americans in the country who had a morning drive time show. He was from Oakland, California, and he was a brother who really embraced me when I got to Austin in 2007. And uh, a couple years ago, right uh, when Texas was playing USC, uh, right before he went to the airport that Friday morning, he had a massive heart attack and died at a CVS in, in Round Rock. And uh, he is someone, some of his stuff is still online, you can still purchase his books, but he was someone we believe as a fellow journalist. You know, he was kind of local in Austin, but he had an impact on a lot of people in Austin. So we like to present Mr. Jamel Hill with the Sean Adams Courageous Activist Award from the University of Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a picture.